Multi-step reactions, as the name suggests, proceed through a series of single-step or elementary reactions. For example, in a previous lesson we looked briefly at the reaction between nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide to form carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Experimentally, we find that the rate law for this reaction is second order in nitrogen dioxide and, under normal conditions, is independent of the amount of carbon monoxide present. Since this rate law doesn't match the stoichiometry of the reaction, we know that the reaction proceeds by a multi-step mechanism. What we are going to explore now is how we can analyze a proposed multi-step mechanism to see what rate law it would predict. This particular reaction might proceed by this mechanism. In a mechanism of this sort, each proposed step is an elementary reaction, so we can write the rate law for each individual step separately. Because these are elementary steps, the only thing that needs to be specified is the rate coefficient, so that is often written above the reaction arrow. Notice that if we add these two reactions together and cancel the components that are on both sides, we get the overall reaction we started with. So from that standpoint, this is a plausible mechanism. Often in a multi-step reaction, one step will be significantly slower than the others. This slow step is called the rate determining step because the overall reaction can only go as fast as its slowest step. First, let's suppose that the first step is rate determining. That would mean that the overall reaction rate is determined by that first step. In this particular example, the rate law for the first step matches the experimentally determined rate law, so this mechanism is possible. But what if the second step is the slow one? In this case, we have a problem, because the overall rate law contains a species that doesn't appear in the overall reaction. This species is created in step one and destroyed in step two. Such a species is called an intermediate because it shows up briefly, intermediately, within the reaction mechanism. This is a problem for us because we want the rate law to depend on species that we can measure and control the concentrations of, not intermediates. So we have to resort to algebraic tricks to, to remove the concentrations of intermediates from the rate law. One of those tricks would be to assume that the concentration of the intermediate doesn't change much with time. This approach is called the steady state approximation because we assume that the intermediates have a steady concentration over time. In order for that approximation to be correct, we would need the rate of production of the intermediate to equal the rate of its destruction. And we have expressions for both of those rates. We can then solve the resulting equation for the concentration of the intermediate, which I'm designating SS for steady state, and plug it into the overall rate law. In this case, the resulting overall rate law also matches the empirical rate law. But that will not always be the case, especially when you're dealing with mechanisms of more than two steps. So let's look at another example. Let's look at the reaction of diatomic hydrogen with diatomic iodine to form hydrogen iodide. Thinking about a mechanism, suppose we know that the bond in diatomic iodine is weak, so that the unimolecular dissociation of iodine could plausibly be the first step. These iodine atoms don't have complete octets, and so are rather reactive. So let's propose two different things they can do. First, they could recombine to form diatomic iodine. Notice that this is the reverse of the first step, so we need to think of this as a dynamic equilibrium. And because it is the reverse of the first step, let's label the rate coefficient for this step k sub minus 1, indicating that it is the reverse of step 1. Second, two iodine atoms could collide with the diatomic hydrogen in a termolecular step to form two hydrogen iodide molecules. Let's write down the individual step rates. And notice that R2 is the step that produces the products, so its rate will be the overall reaction rate. The iodine atoms are an intermediate, so we need to get them out of the rate law. We will follow the same idea as before. The rate of production equals the rate of destruction. We have one step that produces iodine atoms. We have to remember to multiply this rate by two since each time the reaction happens, it produces two iodine atoms. We have two destruction steps. So the total rate of destruction is going to be the sum of those two individual rates. These also need to be multiplied by two because each of those reactions use up two iodine atoms. Now we solve the resulting equation for the steady state concentration of the intermediate. I'm going to leave it squared since the equation I'm going to plug it into also has it squared. Here we have a case where the resulting rate law does not have a straightforward reaction order, but there are still ways we can analyze it. Let me clean up the workspace a bit to make room. Notice that there are two limiting cases for the denominator. 
First suppose that the concentration of diatomic hydrogen is small, making the second term much smaller than the first term. In this case, we can drop the second term from the denominator, and the rate law becomes first order in each of diatomic hydrogen and diatomic iodide, becoming second order overall. Notice that in this case, the rate law is identical to what we would have predicted if the overall reaction were a single step, illustrating how the matching of the rate law to the stoichiometry does not prove that a reaction is elementary. A second case would be where the concentration of diatomic hydrogen is very large, making the second term in the denominator larger than the first term. In this case, we drop the first term in the denominator, and both K2 and the hydrogen concentration cancels leaving us with an overall reaction whose overall rate law looks like the rate of just the first step in the mechanism. Think about that from the perspective of rate determining steps. If the concentration of hydrogen is extremely high, then the reaction of iodine atoms with diatomic hydrogen is so fast that the iodine atoms don't have time to find each other to recombine into diatomic iodine, and therefore step one is rate determining. The steady state approximation is not the only approximation one can make. Another approximation that is frequently used is pre-equilibrium. To illustrate this method, let's look at the decomposition of nitrile chloride into nitrogen dioxide and diatomic chlorine. In this case, the mechanism is known to be this. Notice that both of the first steps are equilibria, written in a condensed notation, and that both of the reactants in the last step are intermediates. It is also known that the two equilibria are fast in both directions, so the rate determining step is the last step. Let's see what we can do with this situation. The first step is to write the rates of each individual step. In this case, there are five of them. Now, since we know that the initial equilibria are fast, then we can set their forward and reverse rates as equal to each other. This is known as the pre-equilibrium approximation. A little bit of algebra later, and we can solve for our rate determining step. Plugging in and canceling, we find the overall rate law. Notice that in this case, we do have well-defined reaction orders, and that one of them is negative. The presence of a negative reaction order in this case is a result of there being equilibria involved in the mechanism. As more nitrogen dioxide is produced, the faster the reverse of reaction two is, slowing down the overall reaction rate. There are many more advanced techniques for handling complicated multi-step reactions, but for the purposes of this class, we will only be emphasizing the ideas of a rate determining step, the steady state approximation, and the pre-equilibrium approximation. You will in general not be expected to know when each of these approximations is the most appropriate, but instead you'll be applying these approximations when you are asked to. It is important to recognize, however, that even if you can show that a particular mechanism produces the same rate law as what was determined experimentally for a reaction under study, that does not prove the mechanism is correct. A proposed mechanism can be eliminated from consideration by finding that its rate law does not match experiment, but further information would be necessary to demonstrate that a mechanism is correct. This is because multiple contradictory mechanisms can produce the same rate law. Further information to support a specific mechanism may involve measurement of the reaction intermediates, for example, or isolation of individual steps of the mechanism to investigate separately.